Good morning, church. Y'all look lovely this morning. It's so good to see you this morning on this cold, snowy morning. It's wonderful and warm at, at church, isn't it? We're so glad you have come and worshiped with us. Guests, we want to thank you for coming and worshiping with us. And just so you know, we have a gift for you uh, uh, just right there at the door. Uh, feel free to take one of those uh, as you leave uh, this morning. And church, we have the honor and the privilege of beginning our service with baptism. So direct your eyes to our baptistry. I also welcome to the house of the Lord. So good to see you here today. It's always a blessing when we can begin our service in the waters of baptism, for it means the Lord is continuing to call people to himself, and they're saying yes and willing to follow him all the way into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, this morning, our candidate for baptism is Elabeth Cassabury. Elabeth, do you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Well, upon that profession of faith in Him, and in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go the Lord in prayer. Father, we have done as you have said in your great commission. Still there are room for others. And we pray today as we meet here to worship, as we share your word, as we lift up prayers before you, uh, that others will hear you for the first time and give their heart and life to you, make their profession of faith, turning from sins, asking you to forgive them so that you can bless them with your gift of baptism of the Holy Spirit and they will follow in water baptism just like we witnessed this morning. We also realize, Lord, uh, that any time somebody is baptized, um, just as your son Jesus was, they were immediately tempted of the evil one. So we pray for Elabeth today that you would bless her as she begins this walk with you and that you would keep, him, keep her from the evil one. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's open up our bulletins and look at our ministry announcements. Uh, for the week, this afternoon, our Trail Life Troop and American Heritage Girls will be meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon, so be sure to be here uh, for that, uh, Trailmen and AHG Girls. Uh, also, um, this week, we do have uh, regularly scheduled um, events. Our Wednesday night adult and youth Bible study in Awana will be happening, uh, so be sure to be here. Uh, looks like uh, we got some Valentine's valentine's day uh work that'll be happening during awana and men just let me remind you one week away next sunday is valentine's day so be ready be ready uh also um uh we have uh, a mission project uh, uh that we are or a missions fund rather that we are uh, collecting money for uh, in the month of February for World Hunger, you see there Global Hunger Relief. It says more than 840 million people around the world live with constant hunger. And approximately 4 million children under age 12 go hungry in the United States. Well, we can do something about that, church. Uh, we have our bread baskets uh, located right here at the table in the sanctuary or right outside the sanctuary underneath the uh, World Hunger Relief Bulletin Board. And uh, you're more than welcome to pick up a bread basket and give to that missions offering. Or if you're worshiping with us online, you can give a gift online and designate that to uh, World Hunger. So want to thank you for... Uh, uh, doing that and think about how the Lord may uh, uh, guide you to give to that missions effort. Students, we are gearing up for our United Weekend coming up the first weekend in March. Um, you can still sign up. We still have five spots available. Uh, the cost has gone up to $65. Uh, uh, so uh, just see me if you have questions about that or you can simply scan that QR code there. Uh, in the bulletin and get signed up. Uh, also, we have uh, coming up a women's Bible study, and we have a video we would like to show uh, for that Bible study. If there was ever a time where the sons and daughters of God needed to rise up in the spirit of Elijah, that time is right now. 
more and more people are forgetting who our God is, that he is who he has always declared himself to be, and he can still do exactly what he said he can do. God's hand is on you, not just the missionary, not just the pastor, not just the Sunday school leader. God's hand is on you right where he has placed you to be used for his purposes and his glory. Because we operate by the power and the presence and the discernment of the Spirit of God, we should still be able to live in alignment with the promises that our God has declared to us. Okay, ladies, there are three opportunities to join in that Bible study. Uh, one is Monday evening at 6.30, uh, beginning uh, February 15th at 6.30 p.m. in room 112. Uh, Andrea Howell and Vicki Wingo will be leading that study. Or you can join a Bible study on Tuesday morning uh, for this Bible study Tuesday morning here at the church at 9 in room 112 as well. Miss Aline Salee will be leading that study. Or on Tuesday evenings, uh, LifeWay will be having an online study. So if you're uh, joining us online and are interested in uh, joining the Bible study in that way, you can do it that way as well. Church, I believe that is it for our announcements. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 84 of our attitude in worship. He says there, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Church, will you join me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, for this opportunity for our hearts and our flesh to cry out for you, the true and living God. Lord, we pray that our worship would be pleasing in your sight today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing about Jesus living and being our heart this morning as we worship him. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, what some joy or my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And the dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscured since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell In that city I know Since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy As onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart For those of us that know Christ, are you grateful that Christ has come into your heart? Amen. Now the question I have, does he actually live and reign and rule in your heart? 
Does he guide your steps? Does he order your steps? Does, do you follow that order that he's laid out there? Are you obedient to him each and every day? You know, we can say we've given our heart to Christ, but do our actions reflect that when we walk out of this building on Sunday afternoon? Do they reflect it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Do they reflect it while you're at work or while you're at fam with your family? Do they ref does your heart reflect that when you're alone and you have a chance to spend time with the Lord. You know, this morning I want to share some scripture with you, hopefully that will encourage you in that as we prepare to sing our next song. In Psalm 37, verse 4, there's lots of verses that talk about delighting in the Lord, and this is one of those. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that's not meant to be like a Santa Claus, whatever I want uh, mentality. But if you're focusing on the Lord and you're trusting in Him and you're listening to His voice, your desires are already going to be His desire and vice versa. His desire He will lay on your heart and that will become your desire. So I encourage you to make Him uh, the desire of your heart. In Isaiah chapter 26, it says this, it says, In the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when you, let's see, for when your judgments are on the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Psalm 103 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Uh, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then in Philippians 3.1, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So meaning that when you put your faith and trust in the Lord, it doesn't matter what this world thinks. You're willing to take a stand for him because you've given your heart to him. I want us to sing about that this morning. Lord, I give you my heart. This is my desire to honor worship you and all I have within me I give you praise all that I adore is with you Lord I give my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Let's sing that again. And this is my desire. To honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, and all I have within me, I give you praise, all that I adore. I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord have your way in me, Lord I give you my heart, 
I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity let's sing that again now I belong to Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. You may be seated. And again, I welcome the House of the Lord. So good to see you here today. Uh, also, I wanted to say welcome to all you who braved the blizzard <laughs> in order to be here with us. And for those of you who are watching online from the northern states, maybe I should tell them we had about an inch of snow last night. So <laughs> I'm sure the folks from up north uh, have had more snow than that. But if you have your bulletins, please look at the back page at our prayer list. Have a promise from the Lord. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Again, we praise the Lord for uh, Ella Beth coming by baptism uh, to join our church and Nancy Skilling uh, recovering uh, from uh, surgery last week. Uh, we continue to want to pray for who's your one? Who do you have in mind that does not yet know Jesus Christ as Savior? And you're praying for them and seeking opportunities to lead them to the Lord. We pray for those you see listed there from our church family and for our parents who are expecting and adopting children. Also, uh, extended family and friends, if you'll look uh, on the last line, you'll see Bill McClung there. Uh, he is a pastor of Lock Gailey uh, Church up in West Virginia uh, that our mission team has been going up there the last uh, five or six years now, I guess, to, to help out in that community. And so uh, pray for him as he's been tested, with, uh, tested positive with COVID that he gets well soon. I want to pray for those in long-term care. Again, you see Tom Henderson underlined. He is our eldest member at 100 years old, and he's uh, fighting off some pneumonia, so be in prayer uh, for him. And also a couple of lines below that, you'll see Frank and Judy Ray. Uh, Frank will be having a heart procedure on 15th, and Judy will be having a knee procedure on the 23rd, so be in prayer for them as that's coming up. We do want to pray for our missionaries who are serving around the world, and today we want to highlight, as I'm sure has already been announced, that we're in the middle of our global uh, mission, uh, global hunger fund, and all the money that comes from that is used by our missionaries to feed hungry people and also to share the uh, gospel with a hopeless world that needs to hear it. Uh, continue to pray for our nation, for our president, and for all those serving under him, and also want to add one a grieving family, uh, Brother Dennis, who's uh, leading our food pantry ministry, said they have a client named Aaron who passed away this past Tuesday, only 36 years old. So be in prayer for Aaron's family as well. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have together as brothers and sisters in Christ in this place, and also for those of our congregation who are watching online as we join our hearts together uh, to worship you, the true and living God. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation that was displayed this morning in the waters of baptism. We pray today if there's someone who has not yet received Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, that day is the day that they would make that profession of faith in him. We also thank you, Lord, as part of our relationship with you that you give us the opportunity to pray. 
and we have a long prayer list printed out and even more that people are thinking about and praying for right now during this time and we thank you Lord that you're uh, ever present God who is hearing all the prayers that are being lifted and you will answer those according to your good will and purpose and in that we are confident Lord bless us now as we continue to worship you for we pray this in Jesus name Amen
And thank you, Amy, for leading us in that meditation of I love you, Lord. And I hope that is your heart cry this morning uh, as we go into this uh, time of studying God's Word. If you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew chapter 3 as we continue uh, through this gospel and allowing the Holy Spirit who inspired these words to illuminate them to our heart uh, so that we can uh, be the children of God we're called to be and also so we can uh, conform ourselves to the image of God's Son. We'll begin reading in Matthew chapter 3, and I'll start up in verse 11. And in verse 11, John the Baptist is speaking. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him, and John, the Baptist, tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that is John the Baptist, allowed him, who is the Lord Jesus. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Today we're going to study baptism um, in a Baptist congregation. Uh, this is a topic that should be easy for us, uh, but as the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, we need to review things from time to time. We need to remember things from time to time. Uh, we need to refresh ourselves, lest at any time we should let them slip. So we don't want the significance of what we just witnessed in the baptistry to slip from us. We need to know what was happening in that moment when uh, we baptized Elbeth this morning. What is baptism? Well, baptism transliter transliterates a Greek word, baptizo, that means to immerse, to submerge, to dip under, to sink like a ship. There are several Christian denominations that have interpreted baptism to be sprinkling with water, but nowhere in the Bible does baptizo mean sprinkle. It always means to immerse. Baptizo was also a fuller's term. We don't use fullers anymore. Uh, but basically, a fuller back in those days was the laundryman. He was the dry cleaner, and he also uh, would dye your garments. Suppose you uh, had your wool and it's all white, but you wanted to have something made red. Well, he would baptize. Baptizo, that white cloth, into red dye. And to baptize not only means to dip, but it also means to change the identity. No longer could you get that white garment back. Once it made red, it was red forever. So keep those definitions in mind as we look at the baptism of John the Baptist and baptism of Jesus and Christian baptism in the church today. Uh, notice uh, now in verse 11, John the Baptist refers to three baptisms, the baptism with water and with spirit and with fire. Now, before we get into the baptism of Christ, I probably need to clarify the difference between the baptism of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He came calling people to repent, which we talked about last time, to turn from their sins and prepare to meet the soon coming Savior, the Savior who was on the way. And in Matthew 3, 8, uh, he said, For those who brought forth fruits worthy of repentance, that is, if they came to John the Baptist and they were willing to change their living uh, and, and turn uh, from known sin, then John would baptize them as a sign that they had committed themselves to living holy lives as they prepared for, as they anticipated the coming of the Lord. And at this time, John the Baptist didn't know who the Lord was going to be. He's going to have to wait till what was it, the sign of the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. He said when he saw that, then he would know that was who it would be. But until then... He was baptizing people to repent of their sins and get ready for this soon coming Messiah. And of course, the baptism of Jesus is different from John's. As you can see, John said he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And John could only call people to repent and turn from their sins and prepare to meet the Lord of all the earth. But you've got to remember, Jesus is the Lord of all the earth and is the Son of God. 
He had the ability not only to hear your confession of your sins, to see our repentance of sin, and the ability to forgive us and give us a Holy Spirit who guides us in the will of God in, his, in, in this life and also prepares us for eternal life, the next life. He guides us into this, and that's what John called in verse 11 the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So now let's look at the threefold baptism of Jesus. Jesus was baptized with water and with the Spirit and with fire. We see that beginning in verse 16. We see Jesus was baptized with water, but to prepare him for that, if you look at verse 13, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan River to be baptized by him, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Well, that begs the question, how was Jesus being baptized by John fulfilling all righteousness? Well, part of that has to do with a word called identification. Again, one of those definitions of baptism we saw a little bit ago was to change identity. Remember that white cloth? Once it went down into the red dye and was submerged, it would no longer be white. It would be a red cloth after that. So Jesus, by being baptized with sinners, was identifying with sinners. Jesus was becoming one of us. Think about that for a minute. A holy God, a sinless God, identifying with sinful human beings so that we could be made righteous like him. That's what it means to fulfill all righteousness is by Jesus becoming one of us, he was going to give us an opportunity to become like him. It's an awesome thought when you think about it. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote about it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God has made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus, sinless, never sinned. God the Father made him to become sin for us so that he could take our sins so that we could have forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. So Jesus identified with us, made it possible for all who are willing to believe in him and follow him to be identified with him in his coming kingdom. Another thing that fulfills all righteousness is something called sanctification, which we don't have time to explore all that that means this morning. But at the baseline, it means to be set apart. And that's what he was doing. When Jesus went to be baptized, he was being set apart for his father's purpose. Jesus was not baptized to remove his sins. How many of you know that? Okay, so his baptism, you hear that baptism washes my sins away. Well, that is not why Jesus went to the Jordan to be baptized, because he was the sinless son of God. What Jesus is saying in his, his baptism, that he's denying himself of his desires, of his ambitions. He's putting all that to death. He's given up what he wants to be when he grows up. How many of you thought about that before? What do I want to be when I grow up? Jesus was giving up what he wanted to be when he grew up that he might be what God the Father wants him to be. And that's what he's doing. When he laid down in the water, that's a symbol of death. I'm dying to myself. And when he come up out of that water, rising up, it's a symbol of new life. I'm rising to walk in the ways of my Father. I'm going to live in the will of my Father. And Jesus said it plainly in John 5, 30, I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So Jesus was baptized with water. But as he was baptized with water, that was only a symbol of what was already happening to him in his spirit. And so that's the second thing we'll look at, and that is Jesus was baptized by the Spirit. You see that in verse 16, the Spirit of God descended like a dove, lighting upon him. And in that same story in Luke chapter 4, it says, then Jesus being filled with the Spirit. So not only did the Spirit look shaped like a dove come down and land on him, it also went within him. He was filled with the Spirit following that. He was filled with the Spirit of the living God. And so from that we get a picture of the new life that we have in Christ uh, that's been brought to us by the Trinity. And what is the Trinity? It's to let you know that the Lord our God is one. He is one God. But he reveals himself to us in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we see all that right here at this baptism. At the baptism of Jesus, we see Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, uh, yielding himself to his Father's will by going in for this baptism. Also, we see the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, descending and alighting upon him like a dove and also filling him, his entire being, with the Spirit of God. And then we see the voice from heaven. That's the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we have uh, Jesus being baptized by water, 
and by the Spirit. And then thirdly, uh, if you'll look on to chapter 4, verse 1, we see Jesus being baptized by fire. Again, we won't be able to get into that till next time. Uh, but Jesus was led, it says in the scripture here, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you realize everybody's faith will be tested by fire, the fires of temptation and troubles and trials to find out whether your faith is real or fake? I believe that's why Peter, who knew Jesus very well, wrote in his little book, 1 Peter 1 and verse 6, Rejoice, even though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the temptations of Jesus are not going to end when he goes into the wilderness that we see here in chapter 4. That's not going to be the only time, and it certainly is not going to be the last time because Jesus was often tempted and baptized by the fires of temptations, troubles, and trials. And, of course, the ultimate temptation was the cross. And he refers to that as a baptism a number of times. One of those is in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 22. If you remember James and John, who were two of the disciples, and they were brothers, and their mother came to see Jesus, and they were politicking for those two boys to become first and second vice presidents whenever Jesus came into his kingdom. Uh, I'm sure she did that earshot away from the other disciples. But anyhow, she was being a good mom. She was trying to get some good positions for her children. And if you remember what Jesus said to her, and she said, are you, or to the boys, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Are you ready to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Well, what was he talking about? The baptism he was fixing to be tried with would be the cross, the ultimate. Who wants to go to the cross and become sin for man and endure all he was going to have to do that was his baptism by fire, yet another one of those. Uh, so uh, what kind of baptism is Jesus talking about? He's talking about being baptized by the fire of the cross. So we see Jesus was baptized by the water and by the Spirit and by fire. The question is, how does the baptism of Jesus apply to us today who are followers of Jesus? Well, Jesus began his ministry to us by identifying with us in baptism. And he commands us, as we begin our discipleship with him, to do the same thing, to identify with him by being willing to be baptized. And you notice that's what the Great Commission says in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them. So if Jesus, indeed our Lord, should be willing to follow, uh, willing to follow in his footsteps, then that begins with baptism. And that's uh, what we'll be talking about next. What about our baptism by water, which we just saw this morning? Again, Jesus was not baptized to remove his sins. He was sinless. What Jesus was saying with his baptism by water is I'm denying myself. I'm putting away my desires, my ambitions. I'm putting all that to death, and I will rise out of this water, and I will walk in the ways of my Lord. I will live in the will of God. And that's what our baptism should mean as well. Of course, ours does require repentance because we're not sinless. So to get the whole ball rolling, we must repent, as we talked about last time. But once you've repented of sins and received Jesus Christ, your Savior, then baptism is the next logical step. And that's what our baptism is all about. And the only way a man or a woman can be righteous is to deny himself or herself and serve the Lord. That's why Jesus... His invitation to come and become a follower in all the Gospels, Matthew chapter 16, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, what? And take up his cross and then come and follow me. So he's saying, let the cravings of my body and the desires of my heart die in order that my eternal spirit may live in obedience to God. And that's really what the testimony of baptism is all about. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, We are buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised Christ from the dead. So again, it's the picture that you're seeing here. It's when you go under the water, that's a symbol of you dying. You're dying to yourself, to your own selfish will, and you rise to walk in a new life. You're going to follow Jesus Christ. That's what that symbolism is all about. Baptism says is Jesus took up his cross and obeyed his Father. I'm also going to take up my cross and live according to the will of God. 
Now, you know, preachers hear a lot of things, uh, and I've been doing this for about 30 years, so I've heard a lot of things, but I've heard a number of people say, well, I believe in Jesus, and I'm a Christian, but I just don't see the need to get wet in front of a crowd of people in order to verify things, you know? But when you think about it, that's a little bit illogical. Matter of fact, it's a lot illogical, because really what you're saying is, I'm a Christian, Jesus is my Lord, I'm his follower, I'm a disciple, I'm a servant of Christ, but I'm not willing to obey his first commandment. After you become a Christian, what's the first step in, in Christianity? It's being baptized. And you say, well, I'm willing to do that, but I just don't really see why I need to do it. Well, Jesus was willing to be baptized for you. You need to be willing to be baptized for him. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, so that works. Uh, also, it's very doubtful that you'll ever obey the Lord in taking up your cross and following him if you're not or willing to, or if you're afraid or you're embarrassed to be baptized. It's not all that hard. Just so you all know, if you want me to baptize you, I have not lost one yet. <laughs> we have not drowned a single soul since I've been doing this. So there's really nothing to be afraid of. Also, I've heard some say, well, the thief on the cross was not baptized. Well, that's absolutely true. And if you get saved while you're hanging on a cross, then you don't have to either. But, and by the way, I've led people to Christ on their deathbed, and obviously you can't work it out where they can be water baptized. They're baptized by the Spirit, and that's really the only thing that matters. But if you're physically able, after you become a, a Christian, then you need to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Um, and that's what my, um, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Acts 2.38, 2, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you're ready to die to sin, live to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives you the Holy Spirit within you, and then uh, baptism is a symbol of all that's going on there. This is why bab as Baptists we do not believe in infant baptism because baptism is a profession of faith by believers. You must be old enough to believe in order to be baptized. Uh, and uh, there's no real reason for doing it otherwise. Uh, uh, also on the other extreme, we've got some Christian denominations that believe water baptism is essential to salvation. If you had not been baptized in water, then you can't be saved, or so they say. But Peter uh, differs with them on that. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 reminds us that water does not save you. Uh, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, again, it's symbolic of the death and resurrection of Christ. So you see, clean skin does not make you right with God. Confessing and repenting of sins and receiving uh, the gift of, of the Holy Spirit is what gives you a good conscience toward God. So again, a uh, water baptism is only a symbol of what supposedly already happened to you already, and that is uh, you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And Billy Graham, uh, the great evangelist, uh, summarized this very well. He used to say, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. He was talking about water baptism. He said that water baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. Water on the outside does nothing unless there has been a spiritual baptism on the inside. Water baptism is your public profession on the outside of what the Holy Spirit has done for you on the inside. Water baptism is your public profession on the outside of your sincere willingness on the inside to die to yourself, die to your sins, and live a life in consecration to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, as Peter would say, that's what gives you a good conscience before God. Water baptism shows our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. Again, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 explains it again. Paul does this in several places. We are buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should all walk in newness of life. Again, there's that symbol. I go down in the water, symbolic of me dying. I come up out of the water, a symbol of resurrection, a new life. Uh, that I'm going to be following the Lord Jesus until he calls me home. So uh, before we're baptized with water, we should have already been baptized by the Spirit. And that's what we see, uh, again, in, in the baptism of Jesus, Matthew 3, 16. When Jesus had been baptized, he came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus went for water baptism, 
symbolizing his willingness to surrender and sacrifice his own plans to do the will of his heavenly Father. And God blessed him with the means of doing it. And that's called Holy Spirit baptism. Of course, after the ascension, Jesus promised the same to all his disciples. In Acts 1-5, he said, John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And if you've read the New Testament before, you know the Holy Spirit of Christ did come in a powerful way on the day of Pentecost. We read about that in Acts chapter 2. And the same Holy Spirit is available for believers today. I know... Some Christian denominations are sitting around waiting on a second Pentecost, a second filling of... No, there's only going to be one Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came, and he stays among uh, believers, the heart of the church, uh, down through the centuries. So uh, the very instant today you are saved, the, day, the instant today that you pray in forgiveness of sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to come into your heart and save you, then you're filled with the Spirit right then, right there. As the Scriptures say in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And I know some denominations teach a second blessing. No, this is the first blessing, and it's the only one that matters. It's when you believe, you automatically receive the Holy Spirit of God. He comes upon you right then, right there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Therefore, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and two baptisms. Is that what it said? One baptism. So again, the, the instant you pray to receive Jesus Christ, you're as saved as you'll ever be, and you're as filled with the Holy Spirit. You may not be filled as you'll ever be because sometimes we kind of fall away from things and get out of step. But that's why we need to have fresh fillings of the Holy Spirit from time to time uh, to keep us on track with what's going on with the Lord. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you were baptized into Christ and put on Christ, that me, we might receive adoptions as sons or daughters. And because you are sons, God has sent the Holy Spirit of His Son into your heart. So the Holy Spirit moves in. He indwells your heart. He indwells your life. He indwells your being. And that's what it means to be baptized with the Spirit. So believers today are baptized with water, just like we saw a few moments ago. Also baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is symbolic of what, uh, on the outside of what's already happened to you on the inside. And it seemed like we mentioned a baptism by fire. Do we have to be baptized by fire? Yes, we do. i give you the bad news this morning. After baptism with water and the Spirit, even Jesus faced temptations, Troubles, trials, we see that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. He is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You know, when you decide to follow Jesus, uh, you just made a powerful enemy. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may de devour. And folks, that's your baptism by fire. Your baptism by fire is the temptations, troubles, trials, that come into your way, uh, uh, they're pitched in your path by Satan in order to try to discourage you from serving the Lord. Uh, just a quick survey this morning. Since you become a Christian, how many of you experienced any temptations, troubles, trials? Yeah, see, it's pretty universal. Uh, that's, that's what happened here. That's what he's talking about. Uh, Jesus' temptations in the wilderness, again, were only the beginning of his trials by fire. Luke chapter 12, verse 50 Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed uh, I am till it's accomplished. Again, he's talking about the cross. And then he goes on to say, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but division. What is he talking about? There's a spiritual battle out there between good and evil, between God and the devil. And the question is, is which side have you chosen to be on? It's there. To give me an example of how this baptism by fire goes, um, I had a military advisor uh, and an instructor at North Georgia College up the road here when I was a cadet many moons ago. Anyway, his name was Captain Kunzig, and one day he told me about his first day in the war in Vietnam. Uh, he was a young lieutenant. He was a recent graduate of North Georgia up the hill. Uh, he went from there to Fort Benning to the infantry officer basic course and there became airborne, ranger, all these other things that go with it. And then he was assigned to the famous 101st Airborne Division, and he was shipped off to Vietnam. Everything on his collar and on his shoulders said that he was a good soldier. He had all the badges and ribbons and rank and stuff that went with it. 
uh, as he flew over. He said he even uh, mentally prepared a speech. And I think every lieutenant does that. I remember doing that too. I'm going to meet these guys and you know, I'm going to inspire them, you know, like MacArthur or something. Like that. So you're thinking about all the things that I'm going to tell my platoon. Uh, hello, boys, you know, we're fixing to go out to war. And, you know, he had his speech all prepared. But when they landed in Vietnam, he met his battalion commander who said, So, you're the new lieutenant. We're kind of busy today. You're going to get your baptism by fire. Get your gear and get on the chopper, and I'll meet you in a few minutes. He boarded the helicopter, flew out to a ridge in the Central Highlands. As they got closer, he could see bullet tracers flying everywhere. Mortars and artillery were pounding the ridge. His commander pointed to a group of men who were heavily engaged in the fight, and he said, Lieutenant, there's your platoon. Go join them and take that hill. It dawned on him he wasn't going to get to give his speech that day. <laughs> you know? I mean, well, what do you do? I mean, you look like a soldier. He was dressed like a soldier. He talked like a soldier. But was he a soldier? So your baptism by fire is your moment of truth. Are you who you claim to be? Do you go join those men in battle, or do you cry for mama and tell your commander you can't do it? Do you hang out behind a tree until the shooting stops? You know, the same thing happens in the Christian life. We have this baptism, baptism by fire where God sorts us out. Look back to chapter 3 and verse, tw uh, verse 12 there where it says he separates the wheat from the chaff. That's where this baptism by fire, the, the judgment, the, tr the tribulation that comes along there. He puts you in positions where you've got to, uh, uh, where the Lord's going to separate the contenders from the pretenders. Um, where the faithful Christians are going to be separated from the fake Christians. You all look like, a, all of you look like really good Christians this morning. How many of y'all are Christians this morning? You know, how many of you got a necklace with a cross on it? Yeah, you look like, a, how many of you got a Bible? How many of you got one in your computer? You know, that's a sort of Bible. <laughs> y'all are out there looking like Christians. How many of you have a NBC magnet on your car? North Lake Baptist Church, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you look like a Christian, but are you a Christian? See, every Christian is baptized by water, and sooner or later, every Christian gets baptized by fire, the fires of temptation, troubles, trials, persecution, problems. And it sorts out whether you've truly been baptized by the Spirit. For if you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, then you will stand in your suffering. You will persevere in your persecution. You'll be victorious in your trials. Why? Because of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Looking back over, how would you do with your last trial? How many of you know that they don't always announce themselves? You're just walking along. It's going to be a normal week. You're not paying any attention. And then boom, it happens. And what do you do? You see the Holy Spirit of God working through you in the situations that you find yourself in. Will you be tested? You can count on it. Again, Peter, after traveling around with Jesus, tries to explain this to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood, by your fellow church members in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So Satan tempted Jesus, and he's going to tempt you. And when it happens, remember this 1 Peter chapter 5 passage. First of all, you are not alone. Remember, he said other believers in the world are experiencing the same things. Uh, we've got to end this church, in this state, in this nation, around the world, and we need to pray for and encourage one another as we go through our trials. Another comment is you are not alone because of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says God is with you. Not only is he putting you out there to see if you can stand up to the title that you've given yourself, that is Christian, which means Christ-like. Are you really Christ-like in your troubles? So he puts us to the test, but in the end, he uses all those things to not to destroy us, 
but to perfect us and establish us and strengthen us and settle us and call us to glory. So no, baptism is not a ritual that you go through that brings good luck to your life. Baptism is a symbol on the outside of what God is doing on the inside. Baptism by water is where you promise before God and everybody else watching that you've repented of your sins and you've died to yourself and you're going to live for Jesus. Baptism by the Spirit is how God enables us to keep that promise. God gives us His Holy Spirit to indwell us so that we're no longer our own, but we start to respond to things as Jesus would respond to them and not as we would in our old sinful human nature. And then the next thing is, have you been tested by fire? Have you been baptized by fire? Have you been through any temptations lately? Any troubles? Any trials? I can go ahead and tell you, we got a, a few going on in the church right now. Temptations, troubles, and trials. The question is, what are we going to do with those things? Don't give up. Keep the faith. And another thing you need to think about, too, if you go through that and say, you know, well, Brother Danny, I, I ain't had many trials lately. You need to check up. If you're not having any trials of your faith, you're probably not living by faith. So you need to go back and say, hey, am I saved? And if I'm saved, am I living a sanctified life? Am I living like Jesus enough for the devil to see me as an enemy and want to cause me any trouble? You know, as long as you're not causing me any trouble, he's probably not going to mess with you. As long as you're living like the world, why should he bother you? It's only when you're living like the Lord Jesus Christ that you can expect to have these baptisms by fire. And so take those as a compliment when they come. And I think that's why Jesus told us a little bit later on when we get there that we're supposed to rejoice in our persecution because it means the devil sees you as a threat, and that's a good thing. So as we come to the conclusion here, let's ask ourselves a few questions. First of all, have you been saved? Can you go back to a date, time, place where you prayed and asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to come into your life and be your Savior and be your Lord? If you've never done that, won't you take care of that today? And then after that, have you been baptized? Once Jesus becomes your Savior and Lord, have you made a public profession of faith in Christ uh, by being immersed in water, which is symbolic on the outside of what the Holy Spirit of God has already done for you on the inside, where you identify with the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And then, of course, the third thing is, have you been baptized by fire? Have you had any temptations, troubles, trials, simply because of your faith? that's happened to you lately. If it happens, keep the faith. And then the fourth and final thing is are you being obedient to the great commission of our Lord to lead others to faith in Christ so that they can experience the baptism by the Spirit, the baptism by water, and their baptism by fire? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for not just giving us a rule book of things to that we should follow, even though there's certainly a large amount of that in your scriptures, but you also give us examples in people like John the Baptist and, of course, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful and help us not just because we're Baptists to think that we got baptism all figured out, but help us to go back, Lord, and see if, we're, uh, if we can experience these things in our own life and also see if we're experiencing any baptism by fire now because we're living so faithful to you. We pray if there's someone here today that's never trusted Christ as their Savior, that they'll take that first step today and come forward repenting of their sins, receiving you as Savior, and being willing to follow you in believer's baptism and then become a full disciple of you. Lord, move among us now by the power of your Holy Spirit, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now's our time of invitation. Our altar's open if you need to come and pray. Whatever's on your heart, you can come pray and know that we got praying people all over the building. Without knowing your business, we'll nevertheless pray that the Lord will bless you and hear your prayer today as you pour out your heart before him. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Savior, I'll be standing down front and I'd love to pray with you and lead you to faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've already been saved, but you've never taken that next step, that first step of obedience to be baptized like we witnessed this morning. Uh, won't you do that today? Join our church. Be involved in the discipleship program of our church. And maybe today you're already saved and baptized, but for whatever reason, the Lord has planted you in a position where you can come here. You feel like the Lord is leading you to join this church and find your place of service here in the body of Christ. Won't you join our church today? Maybe there's something else going on in your life that has nothing to do with either of those. You just got a burden you need to pray about. That's what this altar is for. 
So listen to the voice of the Spirit as we stand together and sing our hymn of invitation. Won't you come? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than him know me I don't delay invitations but I feel like the Lord's working in the house today 
So I think we're going to ask the musicians to continue to play. And if you'll uh, bow your head, close your eyes. I don't think it's too late. The Lord's speaking to your heart. I want to close the invitation just yet. We assume we got forever. But the Bible tells us, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. James tells us don't make too many plans for tomorrow because you don't know what today may bring. So if you don't have peace with the Lord, won't you, won't you come down here and let's pray about it. stand with me we got uh, Eric and Leanna y'all come up here and stand with me they're coming on profession of faith this morning and uh, not going to be joining our church because they're fixing to have to move out to Nevada shortly and so I'll be talking with them after the service uh, is over today but they do come on a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and all you who rejoice in their decision say amen, amen. All right. got Annabelle Day and mom and dad why don't y'all come up and stand here she comes on profession of faith I think she asked mom and dad some questions this last week and she prayed to receive Christ as her savior so all you who rejoice in her decision say amen, amen. and we got James Redmond who's uh, saved and sure and already a member of another church but he feels like the Lord has been leading him he's been attending our church for uh, several months now uh, he feels like the Lord's leading him to uh, come here and find his place of service so all you who rejoice in his decision say amen, amen. All right. and we're going to ask them to remain up front so uh, y'all can come by socially distanced of course and speak to them and welcome them into our into our fellowship and uh, let's see who's their deacon oh it's uh, brother Charles why don't you come and dismiss us in prayer Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come to your house and to worship you. We thank you for the word of God that's been faithfully preached. May it go forth to pierce and divide our hearts and souls, Father, and truly, Father, make your church what you want it to be in this world, Father, we pray. And we thank you for these that have come, and Father, there are many more that can come online today and open their hearts and trust you as their Savior and Lord. And may we live for you this and every day we pray in Christ's name. Amen.